In these boxes is a $500 solar generator setup that I bought with my own money. So we're gonna unbox everything, charge it up, find out what it can run, maybe more importantly, what it can't run. And then we're gonna compare it to this $250 setup to find out which is the best bang for your buck. Let's start with the solar panels and you may notice there's a little damage to the box. So hopefully they're okay. I chose these panels because they're cheap, only $119 total, and they have a 15 amp series fuse rating, which if you're not sure what that is, it basically means I didn't have to buy solar fuses, which helped keep my costs low. And once I'd unboxed both the panels, I was happy to see they arrived in good condition with no damage. Next up is we've got some accessories that we need to make this setup work. Together, these two things cost me about $42. The first is a solar extension cable, which will basically just give us a lot more freedom of movement with where we put our solar panels and a pair of branch connectors, which I'll touch on later when we talk about connecting the solar panels together. And finally, the power station. It's called the Blue Eddy AC50B, and I went with it because it was the best power station I could find in this price range. It cost me $305, which brings my total to around $466, so well within my $500 budget. It can handle 200 watts of solar panels, and it's got a decent sized battery and a good level of power output, which we'll put to the test later. So this one's nice because they include all the charging cables we need, including the solar adapter cable. And then we have the power station. Let's get this thing set up. Let's turn on the power station. So it arrived 57% charged. And then to solar charge it, I need the included adapter cable and the extension cable that I bought. And if I was using just this one solar panel, then I would connect the solar adapter cable to the solar panel and then the extension cable to the adapter cable. And I would just bring the extension cable over to the power station and plug it in here where it says DC slash PV input. PV just means solar. And if my solar panel's in good sun, it should almost immediately start charging the power station. Getting about 70 watts from the one 100 watt solar panel, which is decent for this time of year. But for this setup, I bought two solar panels. So to charge the power station with both of them at once, we are going to have to connect them together. Normally you'd connect your solar panels together in series just by connecting the positive and negative wires together like I just did. But connecting solar panels in series adds their voltages together. So these two panels each have a voltage of 22 volts. Connected in series together, that goes up to 44 volts. And unfortunately 44 volts exceeds this power station's 28 volt input limit. So I cannot connect these two solar panels in series, unfortunately, because it could damage my power station. I have to connect them in parallel, which is where these branch connectors come in. To connect two panels in parallel, you just grab the right branch connector, which you then use to connect both positive wires together, take the other branch connector, the two negative wires, and then you just use the branch connector to connect both negative wires together. So now you have one positive connector and one negative connector for the two solar panels. And you connect it like before, but how do I know this is safe compared to the series connection, which would have damaged the power station potentially? Well, it's because when you connect in parallel, the voltages actually stay the same. So we're getting that 21 or so volts, which is within this power station's 28 volt limit. So I can safely connect my 200 watts of solar panels to this power station. And the solar panels are charging the power station 133 watts, an estimated 1.3 hours until it's full. I'm gonna move these solar panels away from the shade. And we'll see how much they charge the power station in an hour. It's been exactly one hour of solar charging, so let's check on the power station. It started at 59% and now it's at 90%. And that's even with a little bit of shade on the panels here at the end. This power station lets you do solar charging and AC charging at the same time, so I'm plugging in the AC wall charger. Now it's charging at a rate of 274 watts, and I can see in the app that the solar panels are only producing about six watts. They're really shaded at the moment, and the rest is coming from the grid. Of course, it can also charge from grid power alone. So I unplug the solar panels. It's still charging at a rate of around 275 watts. And finally, there's the car charging cable, which just plugs right into the 12 volt socket in your car.
Now the power station is fully charged, so let's find out what this $500 setup can run, what it can't run, and how that compares to the power station from the $250 setup. Starting with the lowest wattage devices and working our way up, this thing has three USB ports, two of them are USB-C, so if I press the DC button, it turns on the ports and I can charge three USB devices at once. It also has two AC outlets, so I can plug in two AC devices, turn on the AC port by pushing the AC button, and start charging or powering two AC devices at once. With all this plugged in, it's using 99 watts and an estimated 3.9 hours remaining. The power station also has this 12 volt socket, so it can run 12 volt devices like this chest fridge. But let's continue working our way up to find out where the limit is. This tower fan uses a max of 66 watts, so let's turn it on. Estimated runtime is eight hours for this. I almost completely forgot about my Wi-Fi router. It's these two separate devices which need to be plugged in at the same time. There's an estimated 40 hours of runtime. My TV uses 160 watts, so can run this. An estimated 3.7 hours of runtime. That's enough for a couple movies. This power station can also run my kitchen fridge, which uses around 280 watts max. The fridge is using close to 100 watts, and there's an estimated 3.8 hours remaining. But fridges, they go back and forth between running and not running, so this time estimate here is not going to be really accurate in this case. In a previous video, I ran my fridge off of a 1000 watt hour power station, which is a little bit more than double the size of this battery, uh, and it lasted for 12 hours. So Based on that, I'd expect this to be able to run my fridge for around five to five and a half hours off battery alone. I'm gonna start wall charging this power station to show you two things. The first is that you can charge the power station at the same time that you're running devices off of it, which is really no surprise there. The second is something that just happened as illustrated by the fridge light not flickering or blinking at all, is that the power station just switched over from running the fridge off of battery power to grid power. This is called a UPS feature. So around 330 watts are coming in, around 80 watts are going out to the fridge, and it switched over to grid power. You can see the little grid icon there so quickly that the fridge did not lose power. There was no interruption. But more importantly, the UPS's switch over feature works the other way. So when your power station loses grid power, as this one just did, then in most cases, your appliances and devices keep running without interruption. So this is good for power outages. And then there's this little space heater. It uses 500 watts. Let's see if it can run. I'm gonna turn it on. And then this thing actually has to be pushed in. Wow. Okay, this is actually using more than 500 watts. Did you see it spike up to like 800 watts there for a second? It says 0 0.8 hours remaining on the screen there. I am honestly surprised that this even ran. This thing has a continuous power rating of 700 watts and then a surge rating, which Blue Eddy calls like a lifting power rating of 1000 watts. But you have to turn on the lifting power mode in the app and I didn't have it turned on. So I'm surprised that this was able to output more than 700 watts for even a short amount of time. Also, this thing is definitely rated at 500 watts. I just double checked the device right now. So it actually output more than its wattage rating, which I don't know if I've seen before. I will quickly say this thing is pretty quiet. There's definitely a fan noise I can hear. There's some air blowing out the side that I can feel, but there's no high pitched whirring noise like there was with the power station from the $250 setup. Now we're getting to the higher wattage devices, a thousand watts, all the way up to 1500 watts for this bigger heater here. You know, when I tried to run my blender off of the $250 setup, my blender got an error code on the screen. So I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little apprehensive about this, but we're gonna try them all out. I'm gonna quickly turn on the power lifting mode in the app. Let's try this electric burner, which uses a thousand watts, supposedly. Plug it in, but I'm gonna turn it on the lowest heat setting. <laughs> the burner just turned on. The power station is using 700 watts, and this is like one of the lowest heat settings on the electric burner. It says 0.5 hours remaining. This is getting a little hot. And now I'm at the number four heat setting. The power station says this is still using 700 watts, and I'm almost to the max heat setting now. I'm gonna check the temperature. Wow, it is 400 degrees around there. 
Okay, so this thing is definitely hot. 450 degrees in some spots. Wow, okay, so it is working. This is a 5100 BTU window AC unit. It uses up to 1200 watts. I'm gonna turn it all the way down to the minimum cooling level, one out of 10, and I'm gonna turn it on. Power output, only around 66 watts right now. I'm gonna turn it all the way up to the max cooling setting. Oh, <laughs> it cut off. It looks like we got an overload on the power station. It says alarm here and I'll have to look into the manual as to what this means. Hopefully I didn't damage it. Okay, I'm a little worried. The gear icon is an overload alert and the alarm is a fault alert. Did I damage this thing? I will unplug this, turn off the AC outlets and hopefully, hopefully this can still run stuff. Can this power station run my 1200 watt microwave? But more importantly, is the fault gonna be there when I turn on the AC outlets? Okay. <laughs> it's not. I'm relieved. So I guess I just had to turn off the AC outlets and turn them back on and the fault and the overload went away. We're gonna plug in the microwave and I'm gonna try it on a low setting first. Let me just try power level one. 128 watts, 100... Oh my God. It just cut out for a second. Now it's running again. It's using 31 watts but it spiked up to 500 something. That was a weird noise that my microwave just made. Okay, I don't think I'm gonna push it any, oh, it just cut out. I don't know what's happening. I'm gonna stop this. I don't like this. Our old nemesis, the blender. Let's start it at the lowest speed setting. Nice. Whoa, 430 watts. Second speed setting, 450. Third speed setting. Do I go all the way? This is stressful. Over 700. Okay, it overloaded the power station. All right, we're getting the same, same fault and overload icons we got with the AC unit. Wow. Yeah, wow. We'll finish up with the bigger space heater that pulls a max of 1500 watts. And then we'll compare this power station in this $500 setup to the power station in the $250 setup. I'm gonna turn it on to the one setting. Oh, wow, okay, it's pulling 300, 400 watts, 450, 698. So it's stopping right at that 700 watt limit. I think the power station must just limit the amount of wattage it pulls to keep it at that safe, continuous power rating of 700 watts. But let's force it into power lifting mode. I'm gonna turn the heat setting up to about the halfway point. Still sitting at 700 watts exactly. I guess I'll just crank it all the way up, see if it does anything. Okay, 700 watts, it's at the max heat setting. Maybe it won't go over 700. It says it could run per, for 0.4 hours and the battery's at 67%, so maybe 0.6 hours total. All right, so the $500 setup could power almost everything here, which I was not expecting how does that compare to the $250 setup? This has a 300 watt continuous power rating, so it could run up to my kitchen fridge. It does have a 600 watt surge rating, so it could potentially power this small heater, but I didn't test the small heater with the $250 setup. You get double the solar panels when you go with the $500 setup. Let's talk battery capacity. This has 256 watt hours of battery capacity, 448 watt hours, so you get nearly double with the $500 setup. Not only can it run more, but it could run your devices for about twice as long. I think they're both really good setups, but let me know which one you think is a better value for the money. I'll put a link here to the full $250 setup video in case you wanna check that out. And then links to all the parts will be in the description below. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.